Hello, my name is Jimmy Walter. Like everyone else, I watched the planes hit the World Trade Towers and I watched them collapse. Like everyone else, I thought it was the impact of the planes and the ensuing fires that caused the collapse. Like everyone else, I became concerned with terrorism. I went onto the internet and started researching the foreign newspapers and articles that were appearing there, but were not making the light of day in the American mainstream press, but were buried on page 88 in a small and usually misleading headline. What I discovered was that not only did Saddam Hussein not have weapons of mass destruction, did not have poison factories, but in fact fought Al-Qaeda tooth and nail as an arch enemy. But what really alarmed me was the fact that George Tenet, the CIA, and the international press were warning us clearly that invading Iraq would swell the terrorist ranks, increase terrorism and make us less secure. I was so alarmed I ran full page ads in the New York Times, USA Today, various alternative newspapers across the country. I was censored by the LA Times. I was ignored by everyone. I shut up when the war started in order to support our troops. After mission accomplished was asserted, I started going around the country to the protest to bring our boys home. There I met Eric Hufschmidt, who had written Painful Deceptions and Painful Questions. I got his book and video, but never gave him the time of day. At worst, I thought 911 was a sin of omission, where the administration had let it happen in order to further their own nefarious world domination purposes. I did not believe that the World Trade Center was brought down with explosives. About six months later, a friend cajoled me into watching Eric's video. It was an epiphany. I knew after watching his video that towers had been brought down with explosives when I saw heavy steel beams flying straight out, some of them actually going up and down, trailed by a smoke cloud of poisonous debris. I knew that it had to be explosives. Please watch the following video of the event I produced on September 11th of 2004 in New York City, which follows. And see, as they say in the Matrix, how deep this rabbit hole goes. I really do feel like I took the red pill. Brace yourself. You're in for a rude awakening. I'm Ed Begley, Jr. How are you all this evening? Thank you, for Thank you for coming. I'm going to be your host for this evening's program. Welcome to Confronting the Evidence, a call to reopen the 9-11 investigation. I'll be your host for this evening's program. I'd like to ask you to please to finish taking your seats as we're going to begin in a moment. I don't need to tell you that tonight marks the third anniversary of the September 11th events. To begin tonight's program, we ask you to join us in a tribute to the fallen, if you will.
we're going to hear from a lot of people uh, this evening. We have a very distinguished panel, but right now I would like to bring out Jamie Hecht, my uh, co-host for this evening. Jamie, would you come out here? Thank you. Why does so large a group of people believe that the violence, the bereavement, and the grief inflicted on September 11th, which have had such permanent and ongoing consequences, some of which we can't foresee, was avoidable? That it wasn't a bolt out of the blue, some cosmic blow against humanity that should cause us all to bow our heads, remember the fallen, and then go back to business, or as we were urged to do at the time here in New York City, to go out and shop why have the questions posed by the families and by the independent researchers, some of whom you'll meet tonight, and so many of you, gone unanswered? In the next few hours, we shall embark upon a difficult journey, and we ask you to reconsider the horrifying events of September 11th in a new and troubling light. This journey is quite difficult. It requires that we re-examine some of our most basic beliefs, this requires overcoming a special kind of inertia, which we're rarely asked to move. And yet, the rewards are a change from anxiety to awareness, from passivity and quietism to a more full participation in the most urgent issues of our time, diminishing unnecessary harm and bringing people closer together for a world of possible safety and creativity and understanding. If this is your first exposure to this material, you may feel uh, very uncomfortable with that and challenged to confront your prior assumptions about September 11th. If you've already been exposed to these issues, you'll see that there are many things you want to look at. We have a, a large group of gifted researchers. Some of them have been questioning the official story of 9-11 from the very first day after the attacks. The questions these researchers have raised has been the subject of countless articles, discussions initiated by citizens in their, in their homes. And uh, there's been official silence by the commercial media about these events. But we've had a tremendous impact on what people have thought. Uh, last month, a representative poll uh, commissioned by Zogby uh, found that about half of the city's residents do not believe that the attacks came by surprise. 41% of New York residents have. That's 49.3% of residents of New York City and 41% of New York State residents. And the question is, how could that view be so pervasive? Why have their questions been ignored? We believe we owe it to the victims and their surviving family members to conduct a searching and fearless examination of the events of 9-11 from a number of different angles and to pursue it wherever it leads. We know of no better way to honor the fallen than to marshal our forces, intellectual, emotional, and confront what repels us, dark implications of evidence which it's all too easy to put aside. We hope that as you draw your own conclusions, we can aim together at a more complete account of those events. If you are among those to whom it seems impossible that the authorities would actually allow 9-11 to happen for political gain at such an enormous cost to human life, consider what the authorities knowingly allowed to happen to the residents of this city immediately after September 11th. Let me please introduce Jenna Orkin of the World Trade Center Environmental Organization. Jenna.
September 11th was a tragedy that has changed the course of history and the way we live. It was also an environmental disaster of historic proportions. The World Trade Center contained about 50,000 computers, each made with between 4 and 12 pounds of lead. That's not including World Trade Center 7. Hundreds of tons of asbestos coated the first 40 stories of at least one tower. The tens of thousands of fluorescent light bulbs each contained enough mercury to contaminate a quarter of a city block. The smoke detectors contained radioactive americium-241. The alkalinity of the air particles was equivalent to that of Drano. A month after the disaster, scientists from the University of California at Davis found levels of vanadium and very and ultrafine particles that were the highest they'd ever seen of, of 7,000 samples taken from around the world, including at the burning Kuwaiti oil fields. Dr. Marjorie Clark has testified that 9-11 was equivalent to dozens of asbestos factories, incinerators, and crematoria, as well as a volcano. Yet starting on September 13th, the EPA maintained, the air is safe to breathe. A report by the EPA Inspector General in August of 03 revealed that EPA's press releases, which initially warned the public about asbestos in the air, were edited to offer reassurances instead. The editing was performed by the White House Council on Environmental Quality in order to reopen Wall Street. That's in the report. As a result of the false good news, rescue workers were sometimes not allowed to wear respirators on the grounds that they might frighten the public. Insurance companies often refused to pay for cleanup, forcing residents to clean the tons of toxic debris in their apartments as per the instructions from the New York City Department of Health. Use a wet mop or wet rag, and where the dust is really bad, wear long pants. We are beginning to see the consequences of this disastrous chain of events. Over half of the heroes who cleaned Ground Zero are already manifesting serious respiratory problems. Hundreds of firefighters can no longer work. And as a harbinger of what's in store for people, 14 rescue dogs have died. The commission report deals with this issue in a footnote on page 555. They interviewed Sam Thernstrom, the White House coordinator who changed the press releases. He said his motive wasn't to reopen Wall Street, it was procedural. His story is corroborated by Christy Todd Whitman, who told the initial lies. When John Gotti is corroborated by Lucky Luciano, that may be good enough for the commission. We should not rest there. In the environmental disaster of 9-11, Osama bin Laden could not have found a better collaborator, a more kindred spirit than George W. Bush. We can reassure the public that the air is safe to breathe, the water is safe to drink. EPA officials were lying to the public and to Congress about the health effects engendered by the 9-11 catastrophe. Because the EPA said the offices were safe and employee, employers uh, ordered their employees back into these buildings 
and thousands of us are now permanently ill. I headlined at Radio City Music Hall with the Rockettes dancing behind me. I sang everywhere there was to sing, to sing a song, but I can't sing now because every time I try to sing now, I choke. So in the middle of October, October 15, 2001, I came to work. Two days later, I woke up at night, October 17, 2001, and it was, my lungs were full and gurgling. Uh, the, the respiratory function was so low that it woke me up out of a sound sleep. Uh, and from that day on, I've been sick. In fact, the air was hazardous for many, many months, and all those tons of hazardous material were lodged in people's homes, in their offices, where in many cases they still are today. It was a major failure by the U.S. government after 9-11 um, was its failure to act as a government, as a government should be, and that is to inform and to protect. Of all the terrifying images, on September 11th, the collapsing Twin Towers were among the most horrific. A shocked nation saw the two largest structures in New York City's skyline dramatically crumbled before our eyes. Given the vast scale and unprecedented nature of the horrifying spectacle and lacking any information to the contrary, viewers could only assume that the fiery crashes of 11, Flight 11 and 175 were the sole causes of the tower's subsequent collapses. Building number seven at the World Trade Center was a 47-story building with a steel frame. No airplane crashed into it, nor did the towers fall onto it. However, this building disintegrated on September 11th. This satellite image shows the World Trade Center about a year before the attack. Building 7 is the tall building at the top. Building number 1 is the North Tower. You can distinguish it from the South Tower by its antenna. Buildings 4, 5, and 6 were office buildings. Building 3 was a hotel. The attack on September 11th destroyed all seven of these buildings and it damaged surrounding buildings as well. Here is a view from an airplane of the rubble of Building 7. The pile is very small. How did a 47-story steel building crumble into such a tiny pile of rubble? The Bush administration wants us to believe that fire caused it to disintegrate. Fires started in Building 7 at around 9 o'clock in the morning, a few moments after the plane crashed into the South Tower. These fires burned slowly all day. This photo shows the fires at 3 p.m. The fires are not easy to see because they are small and the air is full of dust and smoke. Nearby buildings and reflections make it difficult to figure out where Building 7 is, so I'll fade out the other buildings for a moment so that you can see Building 7 more clearly. There are flames coming from only a few of the thousands of windows of this large building. Most floors do not have fires, and those that do are burning in a few small areas only. Compared to other office fires, these are small. Why didn't the sprinkler system extinguish them? This photograph shows the rear of Building 7. This side of the building doesn't have many fires either. There are no fires anywhere along the base of the building. Incidentally, in the background of this photograph are buildings number 5 on the left and 6 on the right. Both of those buildings have very serious fires burning inside. The government has never bothered to explain how building 5 ended up with such serious fires. Despite the fact that the fires in building 7 were so small that the sprinkler system should have extinguished them, at about 5.30 in the evening, the building suddenly imploded and crumbled into a pile of rubble. How did a few small fires cause Building 7 to collapse? According to Bill Manning, editor-in-chief of Fire Engineering, a magazine for fire departments, fire has never destroyed a steel building. I remember getting a call from the uh, fire department commander telling me that they were not sure they were going to be able to contain the fire. And I said, you know, we've had such terrible loss of life. Maybe the smartest thing to do is, is pull it. Uh, and they made that decision to pull, and then we watched the building collapse. Now the term pull, which you just saw Larry Silverstein use, is an industry term that means to demolish, a controlled demolition. What did Larry Silverstein exactly say here? Did he say World Trade Center 7 was a controlled demolition? If so, is it conceivable that through all the melee and hysteria 
that was going on on the morning of September 11th, a demolition crew could have came in and taken down World Trade Center 7 within seven hours. Most controlled demolitions take up to two weeks in intense planning to make happen. If this is the case, the only explanation that makes sense is that a controlled demolition was planned way in advance of September 11, 2001. This stunning admission by Larry Silverstein, the leaseholder of the World Trade Center, serves to corroborate the eyewitness accounts that explosions occurred. Most controlled demolitions take up to two weeks in intense planning to make happen. If this is the case, the only explanation that makes sense is that a controlled demolition was planned way in advance of September 11, 2001. Many major media sources also reported explosions including CNN, Fox, and the Associated Press. In 2002, Thierry Maison, with his HuntTheBoeing.com, first published the only known satellite photos of the Pentagon and the World Trade Center on 9-11-2001, as well as before and after the event. These photos offer a visual chronology of the attacks and call into question the government's version. It is clear that the hole in front of the building is too small for a 757 passenger jet. Although the 9-11 attacks were covered by most major media newspapers, television stations, and magazines, it is surprising to find no evidence of a 757 at the Pentagon visible in any of the photos. In stark contrast to the World Trade Center, the Pentagon shows little damage and remained largely intact. One would expect photos to show parts of a plane, like wings, engines, seats, or wheels, but there are none. A 757 passenger jet is approximately 124 feet wide. How did an airplane crash into this building at high speed and leave a hole half its size? The Bush administration has yet to offer an explanation of this bizarre occurrence. We are expected to believe that the World Trade Center buildings were pulverized into a fine white dust yet the Pentagon remains largely undamaged. News footage shows almost no smoke damage to the buildings, and what's even more unusual is that you can see furniture, like this computer, left intact. The World Trade Center crashes apparently caused fires hot enough to melt steel beams, yet at the Pentagon we can see furniture like this desk and this stool left unburned. And here's a book which also appears undamaged, with pages visible. Here, we expect to see fairly extensive fire damage from the remaining fuel that would have been left in the 757 airplane. But instead, the damage is relatively minor. The Pentagon is only approximately 73 feet tall, and the 757 airliner is 43 feet tall. This only leaves 30 feet for a pilot to clear this building, which would be quite a feat for most experienced pilots let alone a flight school student. Only five photos of the Pentagon crash have been released to the public, and these photos are small and grainy. One would expect that a great deal more security footage was collected, as the Pentagon is one of the most heavily guarded buildings in the world. However, none to date has been made available. Photos published with the article From Deception to Revelation showed the Pentagon right after the crash. These shots show the building before the walls came down, and you can see how small the impression really is. A 757 cannot fit into a 15-foot hole and leave no debris or damage. Look at the intact wire spools. The only hole of any size is only 15 feet wide. There is no damage to the top floors. It seems impossible that a passenger jet fit inside this small hole, and no wreckage from the jet is visible in front of the building. No airplane parts are visible whatsoever. What happened to this large aircraft? As we look at the roof, we can clearly see the building has not yet collapsed, though the building appears stressed. As the firefighters work to extinguish the building with white fire retardant foam, we can see just the one small hole in front of the Pentagon. If a 50-foot-tall Boeing 757 had hit the Pentagon, 
there would have been extensive damage to the upper floors. As yet, no one has been able to account for these anomalies, and no wreckage appears to be left over for further scrutiny. How did this critical evidence disappear? About two miles from the Pentagon, you can see the smoke billowing up from the building as the symbol of the United States Defense Establishment uh, goes up in smoke. So there is an amazement all over Washington. We're also told that the bodies were able to be identified either by their fingerprints or by the DNA. So what kind of fire can vaporize aluminum and tempered steel and yet leave, leave human bodies intact? Phil Jahan of the website www.letsroll911.org examined this film clip in detail. There is an explosion that occurs on the lower right corner of the nose just before the plane hits the building. The administration's apologists claim this is a reflection. However, reflections go in one direction only. If we look at this explosion from other angles, we still see it. Therefore, it cannot be a reflection. Some wonder if it was a static discharge. It cannot be, since a static discharge would look like a tiny lightning strike if it could be seen at all during the day. Furthermore, a static discharge would have jumped from the closest point of the plane, the middle and top left of the nose, since it was in a rising turn to the left, not the lagging and lower point on the right side of the nose. This clip, filmed by the Naudet brothers, two French filmmakers, is the only known footage of the plane hitting the first tower. As the plane approaches the tower, notice the exact same explosion at the exact same spot on the lower right-hand corner of the nose just before the plane hits the tower. Watch the shadow rise up the World Trade Center tower as the plane hits. The shadow, and therefore the plane, touches the building after we see the explosion. This explosion had to be a high-tech weapon or previously placed explosives in the World Trade Center. The Bush administration's case is totally dependent on the attack being low-tech, that there were no high-tech weapons or pre-placed bombs at the World Trade Center or on the aircraft. This explosion proves them wrong. Everybody has only seen a few photos of the attack on September 11th. These photos make it easy to believe that a few Arabs attacked America and that the airplane crashes and the fires caused the buildings to collapse. However, when we take a close look at how the buildings collapsed, it appears as if explosives were used. For example, dust shot out of a few windows far below the collapsing area. This dust is caused by extremely high pressure. When we look closely at the area that is collapsing, we find dust shooting out of every window on the entire floor at the same time. The towers had a steel frame so the only way they could collapse is if thousands of joints were broken. The towers collapsed in less than 10 seconds, which is an average of 10 floors every second. Next time you see a 10-story building, imagine the entire building crumbling in one second. The only buildings that collapse this quickly are the buildings that are destroyed with explosives. We were told that the collapse began when one floor broke and the pieces fell to the floor below it. Those pieces shattered that floor and so on all the way down. However, when the pieces hit the floor below, they will slow down slightly and some of their energy will be used to break the floor. Therefore, there should be a delay every time the pieces hit a floor. The towers had 110 floors. So if it took one second for each floor to be crushed, that would be 110 seconds. However, the seismic data and video show that the North Tower collapsed in only 8.4 seconds. 
The collapse started at about the 94th floor. If you were to drop a rock from the 94th floor, it would hit the ground about 8.4 seconds later. This means that the pieces of the building were falling as fast as objects fall through the air. How can objects crash through steel and concrete floors as fast as they fall through the air? There is only one explanation. Explosives were placed in these buildings before the attack. The collapse of the North Tower started when explosives at the 94th floor were detonated. The explosives were timed so that the floors were shattered before the rubble contacted it. The pieces of the building fell in only 8.4 seconds because none of the pieces crashed into a floor. We were told that fire caused the towers to collapse, but no large building has ever collapsed from a fire. This 32-story skyscraper in Madrid, Spain is a good example. The fire became so intense that it spread from one floor to the next, causing the building to look like a torch. This fire was much larger than the fire at the World Trade Center. The next morning there were still a few fires in the lower floors. Everything inside the building had been burned. Some sections of the building broke. A few portions at the top of the building collapsed. However, the building remained standing, and it continued to support a large construction crane at the top. By comparison, the fire at the South Tower was so small that it never spread to the other side of the tower. We know that a few firefighters made it up to the fire zone of the South Tower because they used their handheld radios to send reports of their arrival. They said there were only a few areas with fire. Obviously, the fire was too small to kill firefighters, but we are supposed to believe that it was large enough to cause the buildings to collapse after burning for only 56 minutes. The fire in Madrid was much more severe, and it burned all night, but it did not cause the building to collapse. Scientists created this temperature map of the rubble five days after the collapse. Obviously, the rubble would be cooler after five days. Also, firefighters sprayed water on the rubble during those five days. However, one location in the rubble of Building 7 was above the melting point of aluminum, and so was one location in the rubble of the South Tower. How can a building fall down and five days later the pieces are hot enough to melt aluminum? The presidents of two different companies that were cleaning up the area told Christopher Bolin that steel had melted at the bottom of the basements in the towers and Building 7. These incredible temperatures are more evidence that explosives were used. Explosives create very high temperatures. The extreme heat created by the explosives in the basements had nowhere to go since it was deep underground, and so it melted some of the steel. Another suspicious aspect of the attack is the collapse of Building 7. This was a 47-story building with a steel frame. It was not hit by an airplane. It was across the street from the towers. Late in the afternoon, this building collapsed. The U.S. government investigated the collapse of this building. After seven months of investigating, their conclusion was that they have no idea why the building collapsed. A few months later, the landlord of Building 7, Larry Silverstein, announced on television that the fire department demolished Building 7. The government and the news reporters should have demanded that both Silverstein and the fire department explain what happened to Building 7, but nobody asked any questions. The collapse of Building 7 is identical to the collapse of buildings that are brought down with explosives. The explosives shatter the joints that hold the building together, and the building falls down at free fall speed. Dust is produced at the base in the building. There is a tremendous amount of evidence that the government was involved in the September 11 attack. We could spend days discussing all of it. Some of what we tell you is speculation, but some of it is scientific fact, and you cannot disagree with it. For example, Pieces of a building cannot crash through steel and concrete floors as fast as they fall through the air. The fact that those towers collapsed in less than 10 seconds is proof that explosives had been used. Building 7 also collapsed in a manner that can only be explained by the use of explosives. 
This is why the government says they do not know why Building 7 collapsed. Anybody who looks at this evidence and continues to insist that the government was not involved in the September 11 attack is simply having a difficult time facing the possibility that the government could commit such a crime. Another reason it's difficult to believe that the government created the September 11 attack is because none of the major news agencies are talking about it. Some reporters refuse to talk about explosives in the World Trade Center because they are afraid to expose the crimes of the American government. Another reason is that the television, newspapers, and magazines in America and Europe are controlled by a small number of people. These people prevent the reporters from talking about explosives at the World Trade Center. Instead of telling us about the explosives, they show us lots of photos of Osama bin Laden. This creates anger toward Arabs and fools people into thinking that the Arabs are responsible for the attack. The news agencies are trying to manipulate emotions, not provide serious information. Most reporters ignore us when we talk about explosives in the towers. Occasionally, an article or television show tries to make us look like idiots. Already, three different television networks have criticized us. These television programs do not provide serious information to counteract our arguments. Instead, they use insults to make people laugh at us. This book, Painful Questions, has been available for almost three years, but it was ignored by the conventional magazines and television shows until Jimmy Walter began advertising it. This is a portion of one of his full-page advertisements. Here is how Penn and Teller introduced Jimmy Walter. And then there's this asshole. Man, that's way too soft. Let me try that again. And then there's this asshole. Here is how Penn and Teller described the book. He wrote a book called Painful Questions, an analysis of the September 11th attack. We show you the cover because if you ever see anyone carrying it, push them down a flight of stairs. Popular Mechanics refers to us as liars. The angry and childish attacks on Jimmy Walter and Eric Hufschmid could be a sign that the criminals are frightened that we are exposing them. However, when a criminal tries to cover up his crime, he runs the risk of releasing more information about himself. These television programs and magazines can help us understand who is behind the September 11th attack and how they get away with these crimes. The executives of major television networks, newspapers, and magazines are involved in these crimes. They help cover up the crimes by ignoring important information and by insulting those of us who complain about the crimes. The news agencies that ignore or ridicule are identifying themselves as being either incompetent news agencies or as members of the criminal network. In either case, we should not purchase their newspapers, magazines, or television shows. We could use our technology to build beautiful cities for ourselves with advanced train systems, but we need better governments and better news reporters we must also prevent the criminals from getting control of the 9-11 organizations. Eric Hofschmidt had been invited to speak at a meeting about September 11th in March 2004 in San Francisco. However, a week before the meeting, he was told that he was not allowed to speak. They did not explain why Eric could not speak. The criminals are trying to get control of the 9-11 organizations so that they can remove people like Eric Hofschmidt. They fool you into thinking they are on your side. However, they are not doing the research. Instead, they are trying to push researchers off the stage so that they can get control of the information you hear. They are trying to put all the blame on President Bush or Dick Cheney. They do not want you to know about the evidence that lots of people from several nations are involved, such as U.S. military officials, television executives, and some Israeli and British government officials. People often respond that they cannot do anything about this corruption because they are just an ordinary person of no importance. But everybody can help make this world a better place simply by showing these books, videos, and websites to your friends. So help us educate and encourage people.
Let's make the world a better place. The entire top of the building just blew up. The second explosion and another explosion. Uh, we have a report now of a fourth explosion at the Trade Center. There has just been a huge explosion. It almost looks like one of those implosions of buildings that you see. We heard a very loud blast, an explosion. Not clear now is why this uh, explosion took place. Do you, do you know if it was an explosion or if it was a building collapse? To me it sounded like it, it, to me it sounded like an explosion. But it was a huge explosion. A huge... I saw the two buildings. I'm thinking it was, a, it was a bomb because two of them. This is actually a we believe debris from one of the planes that hit one of the towers on the World Trade Center. The FBI is here, as you can see. They had roped this area off. They were taking photographs and securing this area just prior to that huge explosion that we all heard and felt. We made it at least two blocks, and we started one. Floor by floor, it started popping out. It was, like, it was if, if they had detonated. Yeah, yeah, as detonated, if they were planning yeah. to take down a building. Boom, 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 boom. Big round of applause for Mr. Jeff King. Okay. Um, I studied physics at MIT. I did electrical engineering for about eight years. I've had quite a bit of practical engineering experience. When I first saw the collapses, I was absolutely convinced that they were not spontaneous. Uh, one of the first things that I did was to speak with one of my patients who is a retired Army Corps of Engineers fellow who's done a lot of demolition and construction, uh, showed him some of the public source videos that are available of it, and he immediately pointed out that there were squibs, which represent little puffs of smoke essentially coming out of the buildings initially, uh, which were clearly a sign of controlled demolition. He had no opinions beyond that, but he said without, without doubt that it was a controlled demolition. That sort of set me on the path of continuing to examine it and trying to gather as much evidence as I could. Um, and the, the question I pose, what don't we know and why don't we know it, is, is sort of addressing the fact that at this point we still do not really have uh, a meaningful explanation for what happened to the, the buildings. We, we have had several studies at this point which I will go into as to trying to determine a, a plausible scenario for the collapse. As of this point, none of them have presented us with anything that I think could be reasonably called a, a convincing and detailed account of why the collapse has occurred. Uh, and the question that's been addressed previously, the enormous destruction of physical evidence, uh, as Chris was saying, the site was, was scrubbed very thoroughly. Uh, out of the entire mass of the buildings that were destroyed, uh, the National Institutes of Standards and Technology, who are now doing the ongoing investigation, managed to save about 200, 240 pieces out of the entire building. Uh, all of the rest of it was, was basically recycled. Uh, you know, the obvious question is what, what does it mean that there was a controlled demolition? At the simplest level, it means that someone had a lot of access to the buildings over a long enough period of time to set this up. It implies, as many other things have tonight, that the, the people who had effective control of the site had an interest in having it scrubbed and making sure that uh, no information was available, uh, that a, a forensic reconstruction couldn't be done. Even in much smaller catastrophes, we typically will reconstruct things as, as, as completely as possible. Uh, for example, TWA Flight 800 was construct, was re, you know, pieces were dredged off the, the bottom of the sea. Uh, a, a complete reconstruction was done to allow a, a detailed analysis. In this case, the exact opposite was done. The first report that was really issued on this was issued by FEMA in collaboration with the American Society of Civil Engineers. There was basically a volunteer team from ASCE that had very limited access to the site. A lot of the pieces that they were able to retrieve were retrieved by going to landfills and trying to find interesting pieces before they were disposed of. The initial FEMA report uh, basically acknowledged that the kerosene would have burned off very quickly. What wasn't destroyed in the initial fireball would have been consumed fairly rapidly 
and would have only really served as an ignition for the rest of the material. And the second point being that the, the fuel here really was strictly office contents. If you think of a modern office with copying machines, computers, uh, and as has been previously mentioned, the, the smoke, particularly from building two just before it collapsed, was, was very black looking. Uh, this is generally an indication of an inefficient fire in which there is not enough oxygen for the amount of fuel. These types of fires typically burn very cool. They, they are not hot flames like blowtorches. Uh, the cores themselves, basically, uh, if you've seen diagrams of the building,